I bet I should mine it. Education and Book Appeal for Ghana aims to improve the education of underprivileged young people in Ghana by providing basic equipment, books and educational facilities. Its work is focused in and around the village of Mankwazi on the Ghanaian coast. The charity is based in the UK and run by founder Roger Gilman and Deputy Director Tom Yendel. Roger started the project 10 years ago after a chance encounter with children in the village. I'm a funeral director in South London. Um, there's a big Ghanaian community in South London. I tend to do their funerals. Some people are brought back here for burial. And my first trip out here, well, nine years ago, was to meet our business contacts. But then I was just doing a little bit of tourist stuff and stopped at this village just for a swim. I don't think the children had seen a white man on the beach at that point, you know, so they were flooding around me. And uh, that's how it started, really. It's a village of uh, just over 2,000 people. It's a subsistence uh, village, so they, they um, get their incomes from fishing. The problem with fishing in Mankwazi is that it's getting worse and worse and worse. The fish are getting less, they're getting smaller. So whereas even two years ago when the fish were pretty big, the fish now are very, very small. Uh, but the ladies get the fish and they smoke them and then they take them to the nearest town and they take them to the market there. The majority of the uh, houses um, don't have water, they don't have electricity. Uh, their water is got uh, either through the local tap person from the mains or it's uh, obtained from the local water hole. Um, and that's really done mostly by the children with a bucket on their heads. The village has uh, many more children than adults and the reason for that really is economic reasons is the fact that most of the, uh, the men of the village have gone into the city to earn a living. Certainly a lot of the problem they're having is children not attending school. Maybe they didn't have the school fees. Sometimes it's a matter of the uniform, they can't attend school unless they've got a uniform. Not quite long ago, the circuit supervisor, so it's wiser from the and within our circuit came to the town and found out that the enrollment was very bad in the school. So he thought of closing the school down so that we join the other village because the attendance was very bad. So since people were not paying fees, they were not coming to school either. So when I put this across, Roger became interested and he made us to select some perfume, the poor, I mean, actually the poor ones, yes, to, I mean, to benefit from the scheme. And that was where we started it. 
and he made us also to register 60 children in addition to the 20 that we have. So I and the Queen Mother went to the town in order to uh, select some people to the poor, the poor people who could not afford to come to school. And then we, we gave money to sew uniform for the children as well, and we did. That was how tea bag also started. Three years ago, the Ghana government started paying for each child to go to school. They pay one pound 98 pence a year. But now the children can only go to school if they have a uniform and they have shoes and a bag and some books. So Teabag now, our sponsorship of 15 pound per child, pays for those things and also pays for extra things for the school. At the moment we're giving it a new look of paint and we also pay for things like for the, the kids to go to football matches and for sports things and to keep the library up and running as well. At the moment we sponsor about 300 kids. Um, all the money that Teabag raises comes to the village. We don't take any, any money out for administration or anything. Um, administration is done by mostly by the trustees of the charity. We try to tie up one person in England with one child here and try to get some two-way contact. So at least every year we try to photograph the child and send a little report back to the sponsor. We encourage the sponsors to send Christmas cards and birthday cards. And then increasingly now, the sponsors are coming out here to meet the children. And that's just absolutely magical. Really fantastic, you know. And it's, it's about a real relationship trying to build up both ways. <laughs> We're working in three villages, and they, these villages are all adjoining each other. There's um, about 450 children in the main village of Manquazi, uh, smaller numbers at the other schools. The village that needs most help for us now um, is Abracum, which lays a little bit further along the coast. It's still a fishing village. They've got no electricity in the village at all. The water situation is, is dreadful. The poverty there is just dreadful. The housing, the whole situation, is, it just feels hopeless. And the headmaster is good, and he's trying his best, but it's very difficult for him. So we'd like to put some more teaching aids and books and assistance into that village. And we'd like to do more for those children. Why does uh, a, a white man with no arms come to Africa? When I started on my journey with Teabag, um, I was uh, just a sponsor. I got a newsletter from Ro Roger and he was saying that, you know, that the charity now needed to become a proper registered charity. And uh, he was looking for people who might become trustees for the charity, so we become registered. And uh, I think uh, Lucy, my wife, you know, said, well, you're good at fundraising, you know, why don't you offer your services? So I became a trustee. And Roger kept on saying to me, you know, 
you can't be a trustee if you haven't been out and seen what we're doing. And up until that point in my life, you know, life was all about having a new car with satellite navigation. It was about having the new plasma screen, having nice food and doing all the things that we expect in, in Middle England. And I came to Manquazi and very quickly realised, you know, that life isn't about that. Life is about what you do, how it affects other people in the world. And we all sit in our little homes in England and we go to Sainsbury's every day uh, and we get our milk delivered to our doorsteps and we have a cold, we go to a doctor and it's just so simple. Uh, but kids over here and families over here, you know, they have absolutely nothing, you know, compared to us. So I think that it was a life-changing experience for me um, coming to Manquazi and just seeing that... Uh, you know, the kids can be really happy, but they're very poor as well. And if we can make just a slight difference to their, the fact that they could have an education, I think that would be absolutely brilliant. And it would change their lives tremendously. Morning. The other things that Teabag does is we look at um, the health of the community. So we've paid for leg operations, back operations, and on this trip we've also paid for nine of the older people in the village to have their uh, health insurance paid, which is, costs about 17 CDs a year, which is equivalent to about £10, I would think and that's enabled them to have their cataracts and some other uh, eye operations done. Two of the people that we have helped in the past are a young man called uh, Ebenezer, and Ebenezer was born with deformed legs uh, that uh, he got around on his bum, and uh, Teabag raised the money for him to have his legs straightened. And now he uh, wears calipers, he walks tall, and he's the manager of the local boys football team which he enjoys really really very much and the other young lady that we've helped as a charity is a young lady called Letitia and Letitia was born with curvature of the spine and Teabag raised the money for her to have an operation to have her spine straightened a piece of cloth or duster, rag. We can use a, a piece of cloth or duster. So that one can also be called what? Yes. Eh. In 2010, we have a, a small baby called Samuel who was born blind. Because Samuel's three and a half now, but he's sort of developmentally, he's about a two year old, I would think. He can't walk, uh, he just sort of lies on his back all day. And that's really because the parents haven't taken in the time to, you know, stimulate him. We had a visit from a young lady called Ali from the Society for the Blind. We're going to meet Mum. Here's Samuel down She came to see whether um, we can help uh, Samuel and how we can help him. And unfortunately, Samuel's parents have uh, not really given him the best start in life. And um, I think it's because they don't understand that even though you have a disability, you know, you can, you can survive and you can do, if you want to, you can do well in life. Um, and I think Ali, bringing Ali to show uh, uh, the parents that this young lady is very articulate, uh, she has a good job, she lives on her own, she cooks for herself, she does all the things everybody else does. Um, so showing her, uh, the parents that you know you can su succeed in life um, is very important. And it was a thing that happened to me when I was uh, very small. We had a visit from an American man, um, and he had no arms. He had a family. He had a job. He drove a car. He he um, taught. He was a teacher. And I think that really um, gave my parents, you know, the inspiration to realise that. 
it doesn't matter that their son had no arms, you know, it was about um, what you can do in life. And I think that if we can show Samuel's parents a similar thing, uh, that would be a really good thing. So Ali's gone back to uh, Accra, the capital, to find a school for the, for the blind there to see whether we can enrol Samuel. So hopefully we've got a bright future for, for Samuel. He's a beautiful young boy and uh, he, he does need help, really. Some of the brighter children from the village do go on to senior secondary school. Now there's none around here, so they've got to move away from the area to go to senior secondary school. And some of them have made it. We've had some bright kids come through. They need a lot of funding to go there because it's their accommodation, their food and their school fees. And we've helped maybe, a, it's a small number, about half a dozen to do that, but it can only be the brighter kids. Tom was determined that we should do more. And Tom's determination is unstoppable. It's just incredible. <laughs> I've never met a human being like it, I don't think. Don't move your don't move your body. <laughs> we were talking about what the future of these uh, students were, was, and um, the teacher told me that uh, maybe two of the 22 would go off to college somewhere, but because of economic reasons, um, most of the others couldn't afford it. So I started thinking that if we could bring a college to the community then we could get more of the kids to stay within Mankwazi and the, the two other villages. Um, and that's important because the fishing industry down here is dying because of the, uh, the dredging of the deeper waters by other countries. So we need to look for other possibilities for the students. And it made sense to have a, a, a vocational college. He said to the village, right, give me a building. And this is the building they gave him. And through his own efforts, he's raised the money to develop the building. Uh, it would not look nothing like this, it was just derelict. And it's taken two years, hard work, but we opened in September um, with our first students, I think 53 students. And we came out here at the end of September to see how they're getting on. And the students are just taking it so seriously. The kids here really appreciate this opportunity. They come in the morning early, they work through to about two o'clock and then they have their break, but they're back here at seven o'clock in the evening to do studying. We've decided that we're just starting with four subjects. We're doing catering and hospitality, textiles and fabric printing, IT and computing, and building and construction. <laughs> we want to choose courses that will sell, courses that will make the students get employment easily, quickly. After we look at our environment, when you talk about cooking, uh, selling food, cooking and selling is something that uh, can make anybody employable. And then when we have uh, building and construction, building and construction is very good for every developing area. Dressmaking is also uh, very marketable. And then ICT, as we all know, we are in the ICT world now, and every child, uh, child has to be literate with ICT. Most of the students we have will not qualify to be in certain institutions, and that will mean that we just leave them to their fit. Now, we have students, some have been pregnant for some time, they, they have babies, but we accept all those people and see how best we can help them and make uh, life more meaningful for them. Now what we do here is we give the students a practical, technical and vocational training and aside that all the students in this department uh, also learn in addition to what they are doing English, they do English, they do maths, they do ICT, they do entrepreneurial skills. And the concept or idea of this institution is to give practical training and make the students employable. So we have 70% practical work 
and we have 30 percent of theory so that approximately after two years when a child is out of this place it should be able to do something on its own something that will help him to earn some income for himself to make a living out of it i think that the real difference just in the last uh, um, year that has come to Mankwazi is that the people of the village have realised that the college is a serious thing and that their children can now can get an education and can better themselves and um, and of course if that if the kids can get a good education get a good job they that means that they can bring some more money into the village so uh, I think there's there's definitely a, a better feel in Mankwazi than there was even just a year ago. All these courses are quite expensive because the materials you have to buy. You know, for the dressmaking, they need the materials. Um, for the construction, sand and cement, they need, and uh, some timber. The cookery is also, you have to buy some ingredients. So it's quite expensive to run, but somehow we're going to find money. I don't know how, but it will be provided somehow. We're always looking for funds because there's always things to do in the village. Um, you know, we built the new college and realised that uh, we needed, you know, more classrooms. So the project uh, has been to put some new classrooms up. Of course, with new classrooms comes new teachers. With new teachers, we need new accommodation for them to live. Um, we need to provide more subjects. We're looking at providing a restaurant so that the, the um, girls doing catering can, can uh, learn how to serve people as well. And with the construction kids, it's the materials we need funding for. So we've got the manpower but, uh, and we can put more buildings up, but we need the money to pay for the sand and the cement. So funding for the next couple of years will be on new classrooms. We're looking at um, funding a, a women and girls centre. Women in, in Mankwazi are the hardest women that I've ever met. They're, you know, they go to bed with, when the light goes down and they come get up in the morning at five o'clock. They go down to the boats, they get the fish, the catch of the day. They bring it up, they go and get the wood, they smoke the fish. They go and take them to market, they sell the fish, they get the money, they bring it back, they feed, feed the children. We've had a meeting while we were here to discuss the things that uh, we feel that you know, would be good for the village, with the villagers of course, there's no point in just coming and saying this is what you're having. Um, and yesterday the meeting was about having a survey with the ladies and the girls of the village and seeing what they want and whether we can bring something that might be useful to them and the suggestion is maybe a, a women's and uh, girls uh, centre where we can t teach health care, they can learn about nutrition, they can learn about childcare. Obviously we don't want to start doing that before we know that the villagers want or need a project like that so the meetings uh, that we're holding at the moment are about how we can use the space that we've already got for other, other things, one of which would be to encourage maybe the younger mums to come back to school and do some learning. We still need more money, you know, every charity does, but I promise you we make every penny go a long way here. We don't take out any costs um, for stationary printing, nothing at all. Everything we're given comes here. We've still got a lot of work to do, particularly at the schools. We need to get more equipment into the schools. They've asked me just recently for some desks. They've got more children attending the school than they have got desks. We just have to go and buy the wood and the local carpenter will make up the desks for us. So we, we really make the money work hard for us. There's still children to be sponsored. There's still children in some of the villages that don't attend school because they haven't got any uniforms. And uniforms cost about eight pounds. You know, it's not a lot of money. But if anyone can help us, we really appreciate it. <laughs>